Hello everyone and welcome to a short presentation on open source license compliance and ORI open source. My name is uh, Dirk Riele. I'm a professor of computer science at University of Erlangen, specializing in open source and I'm also the CEO of BayF GmbH, a German open source consultancy. So when you think about open source, uh, you know that's just software, but given to you under an open source license. You've probably read some of those licenses. You may have noticed they have a particular structure. Uh, an open source license foremost or first consists of a rights grant. That's the good stuff, uh, which gives you the right to use the software for free uh, to get the source code, you have the right to modify it, use it in a modified form, pass it on, and so forth. This rights grant is the same across all licenses. Uh, one way or another, the sentences, the legalese says the same. But there are also the obligations, and you will only get the rights that I just mentioned if you actually fulfill the obligations that come with the license for the code. So the obligations, unlike the rights, uh, very significantly. There's some common obli obligations like attribution, provision of license text and so forth. They're pretty much the same, but then there's all kinds of variation by license. And these need to be observed if you want to legally correct, uh, deliver the uh, code, for example, to our customers and honor the rights of the original open source developer. So if this has not been on your radar screen, you are probably an end user, meaning you are using the open source, or like I'm using LibreOffice or OpenOffice for word processing, and then I do not pass on the code. The so-called use case of pure in-house use does usually not trigger any of the obligations. You don't have to fulfill anything there. But if you pass on the open source code you receive to third parties, for example, if you're a vendor and you're delivering a product that contains open source components, then you have to fulfill the obligations of the open source licensees, usually to the fullest, because that's where they all kick in. Here's a schematic depiction of that. Uh, there's an open source programmer, P, who decides that their code should be open source. So they put it on the web, that's the original distribution, under an open source license. Some vendor V picks it up, thinks that's a great component, uses it in their products and sells on their products to customers. In that situation, the vendor then has to fulfill the license obligations if they want to legally correctly, complying with the license, want to be allowed to use the open source code of P. Only if V, the vendor, fulfills the obligation do they actually have the right to provide the open source as part of the, as part of the product to a customer C. So in the case of Ori, uh, you could be the vendor. So if you are a vendor, don't have to be an IT vendor. Uh, anyone distributing software is basically uh, in the role of a distributor, which I simplified to vendor here, then you have to comply with the uh, license of Ori, the Apache 2.0 license mostly. Ori, which also uses open source, Ori open source, also uses other open source, also has to comply with the uh, licenses of open source that's included in Ori. And so this is uh, uh, a multi-step chain. So why would you care? Well, if you use open source and uh, first of all, um, you don't comply with the licenses, the original open source programmer may be unhappy. Uh, they want to get credit, for example, by attribution, and that's just fine. Sometimes also in source code itself, uh, there's confusion. So there's a license on the outside, but the code inside is not actually of that license because it was copied from elsewhere incorrectly. And uh, so anyone who puts open source code in their, into their products wants to make sure that this open source code actually is what it says it is. Uh, so no label disagreement with what's actually in there. And then uh, wants to deliver it to their own customers correctly 
by complying with the licenses. One particular type of person who is very picky about this are investors. So Ori just got a big investment and the investors naturally wanted to know is the Ori open source code clean in quotation marks, meaning um, Ori Corp, the company uh, that is giving us Ori open source, uh, did they actually watch out, did they handle the code properly and is the label Apache 2.0 on top of on the which Ori open source is provided, is that actually the proper label. So uh, my company was tasked with an analysis of Ori open source and uh, we used Fossology, a scanning tool for license, licenses and copyright notices to look at the Ori open source code base. And here's the result. Um, Ori uh, almost exclusively consists, consists of Apache 2.0 licensed files. There's MIT license CC BY 2.5. And then there's some set of other licenses in the gray rows here. Uh, some of which might be concern, of concern to vendors using Ori open source because they're copyleft licensed licenses in there, uh, which many companies don't like. But it turns out they those were exclusively found in a file called Swagger Code Gen CLI 2.2.3 jar. And I was told that this actually has is not in use any longer and has been removed and it's not part of the uh, production code. So um, we can say that looking at the white rows, the licenses of the Ori open source are through and through permissive licenses, which means that there is no copyleft effect by which any vendor who uses Ori open source might, be, might have to provide their own additional source code to their customers, but only uh, permissive licenses which require in general attribution saying whose code you're using and so forth. So um, vendors, uh, IT or not, companies which use Ori uh, and pass it on to their own customers, who use Ori open source and pass it on to their own customers, must comply with the Apache 2.0 license. So they must tell their customers we're using Ori, this is the copyright of Ori, here's the Apache 2.0 license, and so forth. Uh, unless you have some agreement with Ori Corp or so. But uh, why would you? Because the Apache 2.0 is a very vendor-friendly uh, license. But you do have to create these so-called license compliance artifacts, specifically legal notices with the copyright statement, with the license, uh, from Ori and components that Ori itself uses. You may wonder, am I a vendor or not? Well, um, it really depends on the way how you pass on. Well, if you pass on your code, uh, then you're in this role of a distributor. I shouldn't say vendor, but in, you're in the role of a distributor and then you have to comply with all these obligations. Um, but when do you pass on? When do you distribute uh, your code to a third party? Um, well, in the old days of on-premise delivery, well, your customer got a binary and that was the distribution. In the cloud, it's not so clear. So if the Ori open source code never leaves your data center, then it's not being distributed. Uh, so the Apache 2.0 license in most lawyers' interpretation does not require that um, if you run the software as a service in the cloud for customers that you would have to comply with the obligations for distributing code because it's not considered distribution. Where distribution happens is, for example, with JavaScript code because it ends up in the browser client of your users or customers, so that is a distribution. Providing container images, uh, that is also a distribution. So in that in both cases, binaries or related representation formats cross over from you, the vendor, uh, uh, to, to your users or customers. And it doesn't matter whether they pay or not, um, as long as it's a third party and there's a distribution, you have to comply with the licenses. So may, in the case of the Apache 2.0 license, all sound very benign because, okay, I can say, uh, copyright by Ori Corp or Aeneas Records or uh, Thomas Curran and then 
uh, and here's the license file. How hard can that be? Well, in reality, it can be hard. Uh, it depends on how much open source code is in your products because maybe your product uh, builds on a lot of open source. Here's an example from a car. So about five years ago, not my car, uh, um, Mercedes delivered to customers the legal notices, uh, the open source legal notices to its customers, those who bought a Mercedes uh, on this DVD, I assume. And on it was basically just a big PDF, the table of content you can see to the right. And it would list all the licenses and all the copyright statements of all the open source code doing its job in the center console of the car, the infotainment stack. Uh, the infotainment stack of a car is a huge piece of software these days, 150 million lines of code. There's a lot of open source in there. So compiling all this information, the legal notices, can be a lot of work. Here up to 1500 pages and today, five years later, certainly much more. So for that, um, you need to have some internal process and organizational capability as business speak suggests where in step one, you take inventory, you create the so-called bill of materials. What are all those open components we are using? That's not always entirely immediately obvious. Then if you know what open source code is in your products, then um, you look at the licenses of those components and you extract from the open source projects uh, the copyright notices, other notice files, the license text and various other things in accordance with the open source licenses of the code you're using. So once you have these, uh, these various extracted information from the code base, then you actually usually need to compile. I'm simplifying the process, but you need to compile um, this information into a human readable form so that you can add it to the product as you pass it on, distribute it to third parties and is brought in front of your users in an appropriate way. So it's this three step that uh, anyone who distributes and redistributes open source code, um, uh, anyone who does that uh, as part of their products has to comply with in one form or another. So all the large companies have processes like these. Uh, all the large companies therefore have an open source program office, uh, which is some org unit or staff function uh, where people, where the people are who have the mandate of managing the open source policy of the company. And so they tell you or can help you if you're a developer in one such company, uh, they can help you uh, ship your product legally correctly, uh, doing all the things I pointed uh, to in my previous slides. So they have the mandate about inbound and outbound open source governance, education, marketing within the company and so forth. If you love open source, maybe that's a job for you. <laughs> um, but it is actually requires a deep understanding of open source, open source licenses, internal processes you need to set up and so forth. Uh, my company provides various services around that, perhaps most notably a seminar in which I explain to you how to deliver open source in a license compliant, legally correct way, um, and how to set up an open source program office. We even help you create that first open source inventory, the software bill of materials for your products, because that can be incredibly laborious. If your code base is 20, 30 years old with lots of C code. Um, you may be surprised at what's hiding in the depth of your directory folder structure, a folder hierarchy in places where no developer has gone in 10 years. <laughs> and um, just check out my website if you're uh, interested in that. And with that, uh, thank you very much um, for your time and attention. Please take note of the legal notices uh, with respect to this talk. And if you uh, would like to be in touch, I'm happy to listen to you. Thank you.